you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as we make our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. All right, let's just pray one more time that God would just settle our hearts and minds as we dig into his word. Lord, um, just thank you so much for what we were just able to do, Lord. And Father, um, just thank you for your word, Lord. It truly is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Lord, I know everybody in here, Lord, there's different things going on in every heart and every life, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that we would glean from your word, that we would apply it, that we would be doers of it, Lord, and that we, we would trust in your Holy Spirit to reveal to us, Lord, the things that we need and are lacking, Lord, and need to be strengthened in. And Lord, and I just pray that you would do that even now. Lord, let me get out of the way so you can work, Lord. People need you and your word, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. First Corinthians chapter 7, very important passage of Scripture when it comes to family, relationships, husbands, wives, children. Um, remember, as we've been going through the book of First Corinthians, what, what we've seen is Paul writing to the church because the church has really gotten off base, gotten off the path on a, many issues. And um, and remember, what you see in the New Testament, the church at Corinth, was they had a lot of spiritual gifts. And they were a little off on some things, and a lot of things, actually. But you don't see division in the New Testament. You see the church in Ephesus, the church at Colossae, the church at Philadelphia, the church at Laodicea, the church at Corinth. And that's how we should see the body of Christ. Well, we're one in Christ. Those who really, lo- who really love Jesus Christ, we should see our brothers and sisters as one in Christ. Now, remember, what the church started to do was they started to divide in the sense that some wanted to follow Paul, some wanted to follow Apollos because he was the best preacher, some wanted to follow Peter, and Paul starts to correct them. He goes, you guys are divided. He goes, you're carnal. You're thinking like mere men. And then with that, he goes on to correct them. To teach them that we're one in Christ, that we're here to lift up Christ as a body together. And then as you move through the book of 1 Corinthians, he corrects them on other things. They were acting like the world. The culture was affecting the church and not the church, the culture. So instead of any little dispute that went on in the church, and it happens if you've been around any church for any length of time, it happens. People are people. People are sinners. Instead of letting the church try to handle it and figure it out, every little thing, they were going to unjust courts to get it figured out. Instead of seeking godly counsel and having the people that sought the counsel obey the counsel, they would say, no, 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 we're not doing that. Let's just go and we'll we'll go to unjust courts and we'll sue one another. That's what they were doing. Paul says, how can you do that? You can't do that. And then they were allowing sexual sin in the church. And the sin that was going on in that church was, wasn't even something that the unbelievers were doing. There was a guy sleeping with his mother-in-law. Paul said, you, you guys are puffed up. You haven't corrected this. Why are you not mourning? Why are you not brokenhearted over this? He goes, you need to correct this. You need to exercise some church discipline here. And then he moves from that into chapter 6. Toward the end of chapter 6, he talks about our bodies. And again, what the Corinthian church was doing... They were getting, you know, messed up in the area of sexuality because Corinth was a very promiscuous culture. There were two whole different schools of thought. One school of thought in, in, in the Corinthian culture was, you know, the body's evil and anything that has to do with using your body in a sexual way is blatantly evil, so you can't do anything. And the other school of thought was totally to the other extreme. You know, you, it's just a body. You can go do whatever you want with it. That's kind of where we live in today's day and age. So we, there were people in the church going down in the marketplace, sleeping with prostitutes. People in the church not realizing the sacredness of why God created their body. And the, the scriptures tell us that the body is for the Lord. And then Paul gives the illustration here, a simple illustration of, of our bodies and why they were created. He goes, meats for the belly and belly for meats. Now what that means is this, that 
you have a need, a physical need, and it's called hunger. And, you're, and you know when you're getting hungry. Some of our bellies make noises and they're louder than others. And you know you need to eat. That's a physical need. You have to do that to survive. But they were bringing sexuality to that point, meaning, well, we have this need, so we could just do whatever we want when we want. And Paul said, no, 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 no. Physically, you need food to survive, but you don't need sexuality to survive. It's to be mortified before marriage, and then it's to be practiced after marriage. So that means you can mortify it before marriage, and then it's supposed to be practiced after marriage. So the Corinthians had wrote Paul a letter asking them questions. Hey, you know, what about our, our, our young men and women that are growing up? What about people that are coming into the church um, who, who have been married and divorced one, two, three times? What do we do? You know, how do we handle these situations? Are we supposed to just be consecrated to the Lord and we're not supposed to do those things? And all these questions they had for Paul. And then when Paul, Paul writes back to them in this letter... He, he breaks it down in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about virgins, about being divorced and remarried, about how to go about that, how to use your body to be a blessing to your spouse and your partner, and how not to use your body. And he breaks it down for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's very important. I'm going to tell you this, because this is where the New Testament church lives. 90% of our problems in the church, right, that we have... It has to do with family issues. And it's my wife, my husband, my this, my that. How do we go about it? What about people who, who get saved and they're married to an unbeliever? What do they do? Well, Paul addresses that. This is right where we live. Paul brings it right to where we're at today. Listen, very simple in my life. When I came to the Lord, I came to the Lord as a, a young, young man, about 14 years old, lived for the Lord about a year. Then I just lived like, Worse than Satan, if that's even possible. And, but there was always the seed of the word of God in my heart. But during those years, between I was, you know, the ages of like 14 and 19, you know, I just did what I wanted to do. And I met the person who's now my wife. And we didn't live the right way. And, you know, when I came back to the Lord, I rededicated my life to Christ. You know what? We stopped doing those things. And we put a plan in a place to, to, to get married, to honor the Lord. To try to live for Jesus Christ. Because our body's not our own. First Corinthians chapter 6, it says we're bought with a price. Literally, God gives us our human bodies. And listen, the area of sexuality, it's a good thing. It's not an unclean thing. Again, what was going on in, in, in that Corinthian culture was there was so the, the, the extremes were uh, sex is all bad and totally bad. And then the other extreme was you could just do whatever you want. It, they were so messed up and it was getting into the church. But Paul breaks down what the body's for and the importance of sexuality and intimacy. And it's a clean thing. It's not an unclean thing. And the church had all these questions for Paul, and Paul addresses them one by one. Look what he says, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, all those questions, that's why they wrote unto him, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, that doesn't mean, what he's not addressing here is it's good for a man not to like shake hands with a woman or give a woman a kiss on the cheek. What he's talking about, their question was, hey, now that we believe in Jesus, should we all be celibate? That was his question. That was their question. And Paul's going to address that. And he says, no, absolutely not. Because we see the problems that happen in the church with forced celibacy. Do we not see that? And, and, and teaching people that, you know, the, these people are more holy and they're more set apart because they're, they're celibate. Forever. Paul said that's wrong. Now, practically, it's good for a man not to touch a woman before you're married. You, you can't anyway sexually. It's clear. That's fornication. But you know what? I, I, I'm, I teach my kids as they're growing up, you know, because I, I remember I, I, I was a little boy. I'm a big, big boy now, but I was a little boy, right? <laughs> And as I was growing up, you know what? You know, when kids are young, they're four, five, six years old, you know, and they, you know, mommy, daddy, and relationships, and like, ew, baby, people like, they like each other. But then they get older, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and it's, oh, cool, oh, nice, you know? You start looking around. God made you that way, right? But I remember, 
just being next to a girl or touching a girl's hand, what the, the thoughts and the things that start going on in your body. See, God made you that way. It's a clean thing. So practically, I teach my kids, don't even touch. <laughs> Not even like this. <laughs> right? Don't. Because that's a good thing. It's safe. It's safe. Because your body's not your own, it's for the Lord. You need meat to survive in your belly, but sexuality is given for a specific purpose and a specific reason. So he says, concerning these things, whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, listen, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, the word there is pornea, sexuality outside of marriage. Let, it's okay, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now listen, what you see here, you see the word own, right? There's an ownership there. One for the other, the other one for that one. So there goes the whole thing of the Old Testament where they screwed up with polygamy and extra wives and God said, don't get a king because that's what they're going to do. They're going to abuse that kind of power with women, with money, with everything. In the New Testament, it narrows it back. It brings it back for us. Paul says, let the woman have her own husband. Let the man have his own wife. Twain, that's what Jesus said. In the beginning, God made them two, right? Right? Now, listen, I'm going to be very simple and very practical here. It says, listen, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. It doesn't say let every woman have her own wife and let every man have his own husband, does it? No. Now, again, pass the math. That's just, you know, come on. How st- that's too simple for me, pass the math. I, I, sorry, but I have to say that. Because there are thousands of churches out there that read the text the other way. That every man can have his own wife and every wife can have her own husband, but every man can have his husband too or whatever you call that. And, uh, and every wife can have... It's sad. It's sad. And it's wrong. We talked about that in chapter 6. Remember we talked about those kind of relationships, effeminate, abuses of themselves with mankind, those kind of homosexual relationship. He, Paul said, you cannot do that anymore. You're washed, you're clean, you're set apart, you're sanctified. And Paul says, listen, to avoid fornication, fornication, sex outside of marriage, it's okay to get married. So he answers their first question. Hey, Paul, we're saved now. We believe in Jesus. Do we stay single and celibate? Is that what we do? Paul says, no, it's okay to avoid fornication. Now, he's going to tell us down a little while, I wish you could stay single and celibate. But he goes, let everyone have their own gift, whatever your gift is of God. Now, watch what he says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife do benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Literally what it says is you belong to that other person, and that other person belongs to you. That's what it says. It says you can't walk around and say, well, this is my life, my body, my way. No, that's not what the Bible says, that that other person belongs to you. Listen, when God created Adam and Eve, he puts Adam to sleep. Listen to me. Stay with me here. He puts Adam to sleep. A deep sleep comes upon him. He opens up his side. We're not sure if it's a rib, but he takes something out, right? And he creates Eve. Something taken out. A help meet for man to go alongside him in their worship and glorification of God throughout their life. So listen, and it's so deep, the Bible says that God called their name Adam. Well, there's two of them, Adam and Eve, but he called both of them to say that's how he saw them as one. Now listen, what is sexuality in marriage? What it is, it's literally you're pulling that back, what God took out from the other person, you're pulling it back together, and the term used in the New Testament is 
One flesh. In the Old Testament, one flesh. You're bringing that back together. What God took out and separated to be a helpmeet, when you become one flesh, you're pulling it back together. That's how deep and intimate it is. You with me? And that's what Paul's breaking down for them. And that's why he's saying you cannot just take your body and go out there and use it however you want. You can't take your body in chapter 6 and go sleep around and do whatever you want with it. With prostitutes, he says, what does he say? He says, can you take what's Christ and make it the members of a harlot, join it to a, a, a harlot? He goes, how can you do that? You can't do that. Listen, if you're here today, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. God created your body to live in and through you. And the design for marriage is what? That you might become one flesh, one together. That's why the only stipulation or the only reason biblically for divorce is adultery, sex, because you're not pulling that one person in with you together, one flesh. It's outside of marriage. That's the only reason Jesus said, and the only reason he said it is because of the hardness of your heart. That means even if that happens, God still doesn't want that to happen. Look what he says. Let the husband render unto his wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife doesn't have power. Listen, the word there is authority. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband doesn't have authority his, over his own body, but the wife. Now listen, I don't know how this works sexually, but I know this is what I hear. Doesn't seem to work out in my life, but that, you know, guys have more of that physical drive when they're younger, and then when girls start to get a little older, they have it. When that happens in my life, I don't know, because I always seem to have that drive. All right? You with me? You were supposed to laugh at that, but you didn't. But the desire there is a holy desire. The desire there is not an unclean desire. God made you that way. And that's why when people come and they just want to say, you know what, I can do what I want in my life, and I'm not sure yet, and, and, and I don't want to get married. Now listen, you're not supposed to just get married just to have sex, though that's part of it. He's going to say that. Listen, because one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. You're supposed to be able to control yourself. And obviously you can control this desire because meat's for the belly, belly for meat. You know what that means? You can't control the fact that if you don't eat for 40 days, you'll die. But you can control that desire, at least for a while, until you're married. See, listen, one author said this, that Satan does whatever he can do to get us into bed before we're married, and he does whatever he can do after that to keep us apart once we're married. And that's exactly what happens. And believe me, I have those days when it's difficult, it's hard, it's this and that, but listen, when I come home, I still have that desire for my wife. And sometimes we're at each other a little bit and this and that, and sometimes that's a healing remedy. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> right? I know, no one here feels that way at all. Nobody does that, I know. But it is, because God meant that. He meant that intimacy. And he says, you, you don't have power over your own body but the wife when you're married. The wife doesn't have power over her body but the husband. Now listen, you know what that means? That means like sexuality in your marriage, if you use it as a manipulator to the other person, that's wrong. And then, guys, if you think you can just do whatever you want and then pull up the scripture and say, hey, you have to do this with me because God said that's wrong too. That's manipulation on your end. There was, you know, there was a Christian book written some years back. It's, it's called uh, you know, sex, sex Starts in the Kitchen. Because it's weird because guys are turned on just by you know, coming home and, hey, there's my wife. Then they're turned on. Girls are different. You talk to them a little bit, you spend a little time, you know, you catch, oh, let me help you. I don't really want to help, Lord. I just, a couple hours from now, I want what I want. But, you know, you know I, let me help out, you know, it's in mode of anything. But that's what, it's just a different thing. It's just, I don't get it. But that's how God made us. You say, Pastor Matt, isn't that manipulation? Well, I guess it is. 
I guess it is. But the Bible says you don't have power over your own body. That God made you for that, and you're supposed to do that. And it says you're supposed to do that regularly. Look what he says. Defraud you not one another, except it be with consent for a time, verse 5, that you may have yourselves to fast, give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency or your, your, your lack of self-control. Now listen, what he's saying here is this. You know what the fraud means? It means rob. It means to steal. That's what it means. So what he's saying here is this. Like, if you don't come together with your spouse regularly because you're trying to use it as a manipulation tool to hurt the other person, you're literally robbing from them. You're literally stealing from, from them. You're hurting them. You're breaking down that marriage covenant. And Paul said the only time, listen, the only time you should come apart for a certain amount of time, he puts time limits on it. He says, whatever that time is, figure it out beforehand so you can give yourself the fasting and print. Now listen to me. I'll guarantee you the times that we're apart from our spouses sexually, it's not for fasting and prayer. Because I'll tell you that, the church would be more of a holy place if that's what it was for. But practically, let's be honest. Let's be honest that, listen, you know what? Uh, me and my wife, we have such this great relationship, and we come together regularly. We're in love, this and that. We burn for each other. But, you know, we're, we're purposely spending a week or two apart just to fast and pray. You know what? If you have problems in your marriage, why don't you try that? Why don't you really try that? Try to spend some time with Jesus. Lord, let me see things from your perspective. Let me love my spouse the way you love them, Lord. Let me see them the way you see them, Lord. Why don't you try to do that? But sometimes we do everything else but that. You know, we want to quote scripture. We want to beat them up with the Bible. We want to do whatever we can do to get our own way. Why don't you come apart for a little while to spend time in fasting and prayer? for that other person, for your relationship. And then he says, make sure you come back together. Because if you stay apart too long, Satan will get a foothold because God has created us with that desire, that attraction. And, it's, and that is supposed to be fulfilled in the confines of marriage. Listen, I don't know how far we've come as a culture but parents, parents teach their kids that don't believe in the Lord or even take them to churches. They teach their kids such worldly philosophy. They tell them, hey, play the field for a while. Go to college. That's your live it up time. No, that's probably what you want to go back and do. That's not what God says. Let's your live it up. You got to know who you're going to be with. Play, you know, feel it out for a little while. Go backpacking in Europe somewhere and just, you know, you know fulfill all your sexual desires. Because you got to figure out what you, know, what you like and this and that. That's crazy. That's carnal. That's the culture. That's not God. How can parents teach their kids that? It's crazy. And then, and then some other parents say, well, that's not really our job. We keep our, you know, they'll just figure it out for themselves. Really? Okay. They'll figure it out when they go to school. That's not, uh, that's not our job. Our job just that, you know, hopefully we can teach them how to grow up and make a living. That's our job. No, it's not. Jesus said we're to make disciples. We're to teach them everything he's commanded us. Everything. Deuteronomy chapter 6 talks about our kids. Talks about what? Teach them to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. He goes, teach these things diligently when you wake up throughout the day, before you go to bed. Teach your kids. That's what we're supposed to do. Well, you know, let the, the, the schools will just figure out how to teach them about life and sexuality and all that. Really? I don't want some 14-year-old hornball teaching my kid about what tr true sexuality is. That's wrong. I want the Word of God to teach it, though. Because God's made us with that desire. He's made us with that fire for one another. And it's a, it's a burning. That's what he's going to say. Look what he says. Defraud not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this, 
Look what he says. I speak this. This is what I'm saying, Paul. This is my personal opinion. This is what he's saying. I speak this by permission, not by commandment. This isn't a commandment of God, but this is how I feel in my own life. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his own proper gift, hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Now, what is he saying? Paul says, I wish people could be as I. Paul was celibate. For the work of the ministry. Paul was actually married before that. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. That's why we know that. And church history tells us that his wife left him because he was on fire for Jesus. And that's why Paul's going to say toward the end of this chapter, if the unbeliever departs, let her depart. But if the unbeliever wants to stay with you in marriage, he or she, you ought to stay with them and lead them to the Lord. And, And Paul tells him right here, what does he say? He goes, I wish you could do this, stay single and celibate, but that's just me, he says. Everyone has their own gift. Obviously, that's not the norm. And I heard my pastor say it a million times, Pastor Joe Foch, one of my pastors, he said, he said, well, if the church all listened to Paul, none of us would be here. Remember? Because Paul talked about the present distress at the end of this chapter, the Roman persecution, Christians were being slaughtered, burned alive, crucified, dipped in oil, lit on fire. And he goes, because of the current distress, you might want to abide like I do, he said. Thank God we didn't, though. We wouldn't be here. Because, you know, because Paul believed Jesus was coming back in his lifetime. And that was a present distress. That's what happened. Read about what happened to the New Testament church. Read about the the persecutions under Nero. And Paul says, I wish you could abide as I because to take a wife along with me and on with me, because remember, Peter was married. Peter, and, and Paul tells this to the Corinthian church at a later time. He says, you know what? Do I not have the right to take a wife and to take a salary like Peter does? He goes, but I don't. That's what he tells them. Because you remember what happened to Peter? Peter watched his wife be crucified. And then Peter begged to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the way his Lord was crucified. And that's why Paul says this. is a present distress. You might have to watch your wife and your children be raped and murdered right in front of your eyes. But everyone has their proper gift. Listen, I want to say this to you. If you're here and you're single, listen to me. And don't get mad at me. But it's easier to be single, listen to me, it's easier to be single and keep waiting on the Lord than it is to be married and then want to be single. Okay? So the singles that walk around saying, oh, they're always talking about marriage and marriage ministries and this and that. What about us singles and blah, 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 blah. Well, listen to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as we go on, in marriage you will have trouble. It's not easy. Paul takes two sinners and he puts them, I mean, God takes two sinners, Paul teaches on it here, and he puts them together and he says, work it out. Till death do you part, good times and in bad, sickness and in health. That's what he says. You know what? And it's hard, but it's worth it if you stick it out. And and, And that's why, listen, It's easier to be single and wait on the Lord until that time comes than to be married and then try to be single because you can't do that. You're defrauding that other person if you try to do that. But if you wait on the Lord, if you do things God's way, if you give God the glory, if you come apart for a time of prayer and fasting like that, what, what God can do in a marriage is unbelievable. Listen, when the Bible says there'll be one flesh and the two become one, that's physical. And I'm telling you, that's mental too. I'm driving down the street. Me and my wife are talking. She's saying things I'm about to say. I'm saying things she's about to say. Some of you ever go through that? Now listen, and there is, there's a burning. There's a burning that I have for her, and I hope she has for me. But like I can literally feel it in my chest, the love I have for her. And what I want to experience with her. And then to take that and to take it somewhere else or to cut it off because of our own selfish, carnal desires is wrong. It's wrong. Look what he says. I'm speaking this by permission, not by commandment. 
For I would that all men were even as I myself, but everyone has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. But I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So there's unmarried and widows. Who are the unmarried? Obviously, we know who the widows are, those who had husbands that died. So who are the unmarried? They can't be the virgins and the singles because he's going to address them afterwards. The unmarried are those who must have been married before, who got divorced. He says, it's good for you to stay single if you can. Now watch what he says. Verse, verse 9, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Now listen, it says you're supposed to seek to stay together, to work things out. If you're married, don't seek to depart. That's what it says here. Now listen, and then it says, to the unmarried, those who would divorce, if you can stay single, do it. But if not, get married. That's what he says. Because it's better to marry than to burn. The burn is that holy fire, that fire you have to be with another person. He says, that is okay. You need to get married. It's okay to do that. That's why I don't get these churches. People come in and they say, well, you were married before, you know. And, um, you know. and then they say, you can't be used in ministry and you can't do anything for Jesus if you were married and divorced. Okay, and then, and then you read your Bible, and it's like, you can murder people, like Paul did, and be used in ministry, but you can't be divorced and be used in ministry? What God are they serving? What Bible are they reading? They ain't reading this one. Okay, it's, it's just pretty simple and practical. But look what he says here. He goes, it's okay for them to marry because it's better to marry than to burn. Now listen, that burning is that burn to want to be with another person. But we need to exercise self-control. That, that, that doesn't mean just go out and marry anybody. And listen, people get, married, people get mad at us here. They get mad at us because we try to uphold the teachings of Scripture. We come in and we, you know, we get to know some people and there's some people living together and they're not married. And we tell them, hey, you should get married. That's what the Bible says. Do you both love Jesus? Yeah, we both love Jesus. Then why aren't you married? Well, we get married, you know, we'll lose that. We'll lose our insurance and, you know, it'll be more difficult financially. Well, do you love Jesus? Yeah, well, is he your God? Yeah, well, he can't take care of that, can he? Listen, we don't, we don't just stop bouncing people out of church right away. We try to work with them. As long as people aren't coming in puffed up telling us we can do whatever we want, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. But I don't get it. And then they get mad. Oh, these people, they, should, they got married, right? They get married, this and that. I know, we counsel to, why don't you come apart, get to know each other for a little while, exercise some self-control, and then we can do that stuff together. Because that's what it says. It is better to marry than to burn. But it doesn't mean just because you're burning, you just go out and just get married. And that's what Christians do. They'll, they'll, they'll go out and they'll say, well, you know what? I go to this church. There's only a few hundred people in, in, in this church. And you know, I've been to the other big churches and I, I can't find anybody over there. So I go to this church and there's not, there's, there's, it's like slim pickings there. <laughs> All right? You know. So what God wants in this church is wide, wide pickings. All right? All right. So so what, what God must want, what God must want is for us to go out and find somebody out there and then get them to convert back to Christ so I can marry them. That's not what God wants. Some of us came in that way and God has worked through some of those things, but if you've done that and I was one of them, listen, there's a lot of heartache that comes along with that. Try to do it right from Jump Street. Try to do it right the first time. Don't play games with God and say, God, you know what? You know, these, these Christian people are weird anyway. Yeah, I am one. I'm going to heaven. But I, 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 the husband, the wife, thing, I can't find any. And there's not, you know. So I'm going to go find one out there. And I'll play dating evangelism. <laughs> and that's what we'll do. And I'll play dating evangelism. And I'll, I'll get them to love me. And if I can get them to love me, I can get them to love you. You know, that's a con that goes all the way back. Read the book of Genesis. Remember the story of Baal? I mean, Balaam and Balak. Okay, so Balak, I don't have time to get into the whole story, but briefly, 
Balak hired Balaam, a prophet, to curse Israel. Okay? So every time that Balaam would stand up over the children of Israel as they were growing in the wilderness wanderings, he'd try to curse them, and a blessing for Israel came out of his mouth. It's kind of a strange story. It happened, he brought him up on another mountain. Balak said, curse Israel. Y'all this, you know, this prophet of God. He was a prophet for hire, by the way. And he, he was supposed to curse Israel. Every time he tried to curse them, a blessing came out of his mouth. Balak said, what are you doing to me? You keep blessing them, I'm telling you, you need to curse them. Do you know what Balaam come up with? This is what he come up with. He goes, hey, I can't curse them. Something divine is happening here. God's forcing me to bless them. I'm trying to curse them. He goes, but what you need to do is find some of your women that don't follow Jehovah, God, and send them in into the young men. And that will turn their heart from God, and God will be forced to chastise them. And that's exactly what happened. And that's usually what happens. That's Satan's game. Hey, let me find someone out here. You know what? And I'll turn their heart. No, what happens is it goes the other way. It goes the other way. We need to do the best we can to protect the sanctity of marriage. And listen, if here, if you're single, don't just marry anybody. Wait on the Lord. Some of the ladies are saying, I wish I waited longer. Some of the guys are saying, I can't wait long enough. And the, I wish I waited longer. And again, you know the old song, love the one you wait, love the one you wait. All right, do a little of that, right? The one you're married to. And then, and then there's the Christians who play games. They do this. They play games. They say, well, because we didn't do it the right way, and we should have waited longer, and we didn't, and we had sex before we were married, and then we made it right. So that must have not have been God's will anyway. So that really doesn't count. So we could just like start all over again. What? <laughs> like you're going to just erase that part of your life and, you know, that doesn't count. And we'll just start all over again. Wrong. When you come together, when you're married, you make that commitment before God and before man. That's the one you're married to. Now, listen, guys. If you want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to the measure that you love your wife is to the measure that you'll be used in ministry. Hear me. You want to do more for Jesus? Your wife's either going to be a hindrance or a help. God said she's a help. And if you say she's a hindrance, it's because you need to love her more so you can be used more in ministry. Listen, I've learned this. I've come, listen, when I wanted to be, do more for Jesus Christ, this is what I used to do. When me and Larissa first started coming to church, I'd be like, Larissa, you have to do this, and you have to read that, and you have to do this, and if you don't do that, you're not holy. And all that whole time, she's falling in love with Jesus Christ, and I'm trying to force her into the woman that I want her to be. Guys, you can't force. If a woman don't submit, you can't make her. Okay? Now listen. To the measure that you love your wife is to the measure that you can be used in ministry. And I've seen that. Now, listen, my wife loves Jesus, I'm telling you, more than I do. My wife loves the ministry more than I do. I'm just being honest with you. My wife wants to serve more than I do. And some of you who know her know that I'm not just talking baloney up here. It's the truth. And what does the Bible say we're supposed to do with our wives? Listen, it says, if you find a prudent wife, you find a gift from the Lord. That's what it says. Read Proverbs. You find a, you find a wife, her price is far above rubies. You're supposed to dwell with them. You're supposed to love them. You're supposed to teach them. You're supposed to honor them. That's what you're supposed to do. And Paul's going to talk about that as you go through the chapter here. Listen, I couldn't do near the amount of ministry that I do today if it wasn't for my wife supporting me, coming alongside, pushing me closer to Jesus. Is that the way we love one another? Is that how we encourage one another in our marriages? Is that what we do? Or are we trying to separate and divide and push aside and control? Or are we surrendered to Jesus Christ? Listen, because when you're surrendered to Jesus Christ 
and you see things from his perspective, you stop going to the Lord. Because I did this for so long. I go to the Lord and say, Lord, why can't this woman just do this and be this way and do these things and blah, blah, blah. Now I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, make me the man that you want me to be for your glory. Make me more of a man for her and my kids. And then I don't just pray that once. I pray that all the time, a thousand times a year. And God will answer that prayer because it's an unselfish prayer. 